Hi all, Carbermon here, and uh, today um, we're going to look at the Slayer's Guide to Undead by Gary Gygix and John Creffield. Um, so right away, I'm going to let you know there is a mature rating on this video, simply because there is some nudish ideas and I believe one suggestive image. Um, so, the Slayer's Guide series is honestly really good. Um, as you can see, here's some really cool art here. This guy's just like taking a bite out of crime. Um, it starts off with an introduction, which is eh, kind of mediocre. Some good art, though. Okay, so this part's really cool. What should and should not be undead? A guideline for the game's master. So it goes over humanoid, fey, giants, monstrous humanoids, Animals, beasts, and magical beasts, shape changers, aberrations, aberration, sorry. <clears throat> then you have dragons, vermin, plants, elementals, and outsiders. So, not all of these things are going to be very undead compatible. And it gives the reasoning for it. Uh, once again, some really cool art. Uh, there's like a throne and a decaying corpse on it. <clears throat> Talking about the undead psyche, supernatural and spawned undead, weaknesses, how the undead sense things. Uh, like, <clears throat> this, this book really dives into what it means to be undead. And Gary's version of Undead. And to me, that matters more for D&D than anything else that has come out since this book. Because Gary's name's on it. Gary invented D&D. And, yeah, just, it, it brings back feelings of Diablo and just how that worked. So, you have these sections, the unwilled living dead. These are not dead or undead by their choice. So here's the intelligent skeleton or skeletal undead. And uh, you have guidelines and all sorts of stuff for it. Every creature has scenario hooks and ideas. And I've read through a bunch of them. It's pretty cool. It's very thematic. Uh, the next one is a zombified, or sorry, intelligent zombified undead. So, what I don't like is they're like, oh, these things are always evil because, well, that's obvious. But at the same time, could you imagine if you were afflicted with a curse that made you this way? So, I mean, I think they should give examples like that. That would really enhance the nature of being an intelligent zombie. I mean, willingly doing that to yourself for no apparent reason, that, yeah, that's horrible. That's probably evil. But, like, if you're under the affliction of a curse, uh, yeah, new one, well done, dead. Skissassin. So these things are cool. Uh, there's a spell that comes with it. Um... These things have spider climb. 
they're not just going to be obvious. They will only fight to get to their target. It's an assassin that is an animated murderer. And that's pretty cool. Um, and that there's a scenario hook and idea. And then you have the free will living undead Bodax. And of course, that's what the Bodak looks like. Um, and they have role playing sections, methods of warfare, uh, habitat, society, physiology, um, creating a Bodak. Bodak characters must be chaotic evil. And so. At least they give you play options. Uh, devourers. Towering horrors. Able to rip the life force from a living being and feed upon it. The devourers are uh, repellent things from man's worst nightmares. Um, once again, some really cool art. Devourer template. Creating a devourer. <clears throat> and uh, once again, there's some nudity. The Ghoul King. Large undead. That's, I mean... The, the cool thing about this is the fact... Uh, role playing with the varied undead so it gives you more depth into this aspect for instance uh role playing with ghoulish undead ghouls are versatile monsters easy to include in city wilderness aquatic or dungeon adventures little justification is required to explain the presence of grave robbing ghouls in the local cemetery how many unmarked battlefields are there in the Wilderlands, or Wilderlands, whatever, through which the party treks? What number of sunken pirate ships lay beneath the waters their vessel crosses? An appearance by ghouls or ghasts can happen at nearly any time the game's master desires it. The involvement of ghouls in an obscene rites pra uh, practiced by black magicians and their ilk is a matter of record. Moonlight, human followers, uh, an ecstatic stay and join with ghouls called forth from their tunnels in unholy feasts of human flesh. Mortals engaging in such practices become ghouls themselves after death, and the demented cult members view this as a blessing from their black gods. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that just sounds metal, dude. Um, being intelligent, the ghouls can serve an evil master as spies and soldiers. Com uh, companies of ghouls will go um, into battle beneath the standard of an evil demigod or as pa uh, part of a powerful evil temple's host. Gleefully, the human temple leaders allow the ghouls to feast on the corpses littering the battlefield, battlefields on which they fought, a small price to pay for such welcome service. Losses in the undead ranks are easy to replace, and cultists take prisoners, giving them to the ghouls to torture and kill, uh, and then removing the corpses so that they arise as ghouls themselves. A uh, ghoulish undead template, creating a ghoul. So, obviously there's a lot to this, and we're already at nine minutes. So, I don't want to go too far into this. I, I mean, too in-depth. We're going to go through the entire thing. But, it, there's example characters. More scenario hooks. Morgs. It's just far more information than you got in the Monster Manual for uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition. Um, mummies. 
And it just goes in real depth for this. Just like that long example of that I gave for the ghouls, which, uh, wow. It, it has a little bit of everything in there. New ideas. White. That's awesome. Come on. I almost, okay, got it. Spirits of Evil. Scenario hooks. Like, look at that awesome art. I have to say that next to Van Richten's Guide to Ghosts for AD&D 2nd Edition, this is probably my favorite monster book. And the reason is... Th there's a rhyme and reason to include creatures where they are. And you don't find that often enough in many monster products. And I mean, there's tons of cool creatures, but how you use them to feel any sort of natural, like, the verisimilitude aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, there's just some really cool art here. And the scenario hooks going into how the undead function. It just... These guys really thought about every little thing that goes into this because it would take forever to actually speak aloud this stuff. Um, like here, uh, purple, yellow, and red wraiths. Uh, the purple wraiths are generally regarded as the most wicked of wraith kind and rise only at the behest of one of hell's lords. The yellow wraith comes into being when a highly evil individual succumbs to a curse, or sorry, disease. Well, a red wraith can come into being when a depraved being meets a violent end. So, there's a lore aspect to it. And players that are, or become more familiar with the slightest piece of information may help them get rid of a later problem in your campaign easier. That's pretty awesome. Oh. Yeah, I, I mean, Vampires. Uh, there, there's that suggestive pose. Okay, so the peak of an, the Night Lord is an adventure. Uh, not trying to spoil that for you. 
because uh, okay there we are and let's get that out of there so that way you guys don't take too much of it bestiary of the damned okay It's not very big, but it, it's here. And it just there's so much information you need to write down or whatever. Just write down what you're using them for. Uh, any skills they have, just kind of write what they would do or basically use their skills or whatever to come up with a personality type, right? And then you take that personality type, like, ooh, move silently, plus 14. So, and, so obviously it's using stealth, but I don't know why it has bluff, you know? I, yeah, so come up with basically a personality type that you want the creature to act in based off of their skills and everything and their feats don't include every little thing here because seriously you're talking about an hour for every creature you want to have in here just what sort of what are they wielding? How capable is it? Like, don't don't waste your time. If you can't fit all the information you need on a 3x5 card, you might be putting too much effort into an encounter. I understand that uh, you want to have a good encounter but the thing is is depth is not necessarily what makes a good encounter the the encounters are made more memorable that's pretty sick encounters are made more memorable when you have fluidity so Base every creature you're you're dealing with off of a fluid idea. Well, what do I mean by that? If the process doesn't flow for you to be able to say what a creature is doing and how it's doing it, then are you adding anything to the game? And I, I'm not saying pull pull the map Mercer. I'm saying if your creature doesn't fit the theme your adventure is going for, the players will feel less connected. You want the players to be absolutely, absolutely absorbed into what it is you're doing. And if you're looking at stat blocks you have no intent on using ever, because they don't make sense for what it is you're doing. Then. What what are you trying to accomplish? Does that make sense? Like. Run the game. With as little fuss as possible. Remember every rule in Dungeons and Dragons is a guideline. All right, cover them one out. 